Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we still thank you for this day, and we, we still thank you for each and every breath that you give us. Lord, we know that even the breath that we just took is a gift from you. We so thank you that you are a God of mulligans. You are a God that allows us to get it wrong and get it wrong and get it wrong. And you love us so much that you pursue us until we get it right. And so, Lord, have at it in us through this renewal service. Help us to not just be hearers of the word, but to hear with the intentions of doing so that we may be your workmanship, that we may be able to profess the good news of the gospel with boldness and confidence so that others may move from death to life. Give us the passion that we need to save the lost. If there is 75,000 lost in just this county alone, what are we doing about it? And so, Lord, do your work in us, we pray. We pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. God's people said. Amen. Pastor Fritz, welcome back. Hope you had a good afternoon. Thanks for bringing such wonderful weather. <laughs> hey, uh, I am just in sales. I am not in management. So. Uh, Emery, thanks for, uh, for those opening words. And I'd like to say this, uh, just briefly to start off. Um, that is the essence of discipleship, uh, by the way. Uh, so uh, somebody comes and shares God's truth with great clarity. Uh, you hear that. You receive that. You internalize it and own it. Going into other verses we even talk about this morning, Philippians, uh, Ephesians, I'm sure among others. And then sharing that with other people, right? That is the essence of disciple making. Uh, so uh, you witness that firsthand uh, from this morning. Uh, to this afternoon. So, uh, Emery, that was fantastic. Um, and I think we can all go home now. So, uh, we've saved a lot of time <laughs> and energy. Uh, no, I want to tell you this, um, just kind of right up front, um, what we're going to do uh, during our time at some point uh, tonight is we're actually going to, I'm going to ask you, uh, if you're comfortable with it, um, to uh, cluster into some groups uh, of maybe four to five, and we're actually going to take some time to pray together, because we're not just going to talk about prayer tonight, we're actually going to engage in it. It's one thing, it's one thing to talk about something, it's a whole nother to actually engage in it in a real way, because uh, again, that's disciple making. Not simply being hearers of the word, uh, not simply uh, you know hearing it and internalizing it, but then actually taking the steps within that. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you'll turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, and uh, we're going to be there again. While you're going to Acts 1, I'd like to share a little bit more about uh, who I am. Uh, I was not raised in a Christian household. Um, actually, uh, my, my mom uh, was a nominal Catholic, and my dad was uh, a Lutheran by birth only. And so uh, when my sisters and I came onto the scene, uh, we kind of had uh, pretty much a non-existent understanding of, of who God was. And uh, my parents divorced when I was three years old, and I lived with my mom in 11 different places in eight different states from the time I was three until I was 10. And so uh, we moved around a lot. Uh, and when I was 10, uh, I ended up, uh, my, myself and my two older sisters, we moved in with my dad. And, and I didn't know him that well. We saw him maybe once a year every now and again. Uh, but I didn't know him that well. But I did know this as a 10-year-old. Uh, sometimes you've got to stay out of dad's way, right? Because at 10 years old, uh, you don't know what an alcoholic is. At 10 years old, you don't know what uh, somebody battling and succumbing to depression looks like. Um, you just know you need to stay out of their way sometimes, because if not, it gets really, really ugly. And so I learned that at 10 years old. When I was 16 years old, uh, I met Jesus. And uh, I may share some more of that story later, but the short of it is this. Uh, I met Jesus, and he radically transformed my life. Uh, I cannot even begin to express to you the trajectory that I was on before I met Jesus and how he 
profoundly change that. Uh, my wife and I did not meet until after I met Christ, and I'm so thankful for that, because I guarantee she would not have liked me or agreed to marry me had she known me <laughs> before I met Jesus. But I can tell you that I'm not the same person at all, uh, in any shape uh, or, or form. And I loved my dad, because I think as, as kids, even when you go through challenging stuff, you still love your parents, because it's just what you do, right? And so I loved my dad, uh, but we did not have a good relationship. And my dad was not interested in God. I remember when I came to faith, I thought, the only reason my dad has not also become a Christian is because nobody's ever told him. So I remember I went and told him the whole gospel as I knew it as a 16-year-old kid who had been saved for like a week. Uh, which was probably not very good. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember my dad just kind of staring at me. And he goes, yeah, I've already heard that. No thanks. Um, and so my, my dad was not interested in God. Um, and my dad really wasn't interested in me either. And so I decided from that point forward that probably just the best way that I could serve him, uh, the best way that we could maintain uh, somewhat of a relationship, is I would play a role of praying for him. Uh, that was just probably the best way that I could minister to him. So, so that's what I chose to do. And I held a deep, deep conviction within me that God could save my dad. And I also knew that my dad would never come to faith. I believed both of those things deeply within me. And so prayer is this remarkable gift from God. It's, it's, it, we don't even fully grasp what, what is happening when we pray? But it's this remarkable gift from God. Because think about this, that believers can talk to God anytime we want to talk to Him. And we can talk to Him about anything that we want to talk with Him about. And actually, the more transparent we are, the more vulnerable we are with Him in prayer, uh, it just deepens that relationship and that connection that we have with Him. And, and while it's this remarkable gift, at the same time, Prayer is challenging. I don't know if you feel that tension in your own life. I feel that tension in my life uh, quite a bit. That prayer is something I'm drawn to, and at the same time, it's challenging. And, and even when I take steps of growth in it, at the same time, I feel like I don't even know what I'm doing uh, when I'm praying at times. Uh, maybe, maybe you're like me, and, and there's been seasons where you've wondered if our prayers, is my prayer even making a difference? Or, or am I just sending up wishes and hopes and, and God's already got his plan in place and, and, and I'm just you know, trying to be in there somewhere? Um, maybe, maybe you've wrestled with this as well, is that uh, we're not really sure where we land on this whole idea of prayer. And so what we do is we spend our time doing things that are more practical, right? I'll do things that are a little bit more practical. Uh, and so we do more than we pray. Or what we end up doing is we actually pray the same things over and over again. Maybe they're different words, but they're the same themes, they're the same concepts, we're praying for the same people, we're asking for the same stuff over and over again, and, and we wonder why it feels repetitive, why it feels dry, why it feels like I'm not running to prayer, but I'm doing it because I should. And it's just a discipline, and it's something I know I should do each day, like taking my vitamins or eating broccoli or drinking kale juice, whatever you're into. I don't know what it is, but nonetheless, right? It's more this thing that should be done because good Christians do it as opposed to, I'm going to be spending time with my father. And if it runs a half an hour, if it runs an hour, if it runs three hours, I don't care because I'm with my father, right? And so... Because we're unsure of prayer in our own lives, we tend not to pray in meaningful ways when we're with others. Right? We reserve, we hold ourselves back, right? And, and we kind of will engage in prayer at a surface level as opposed to coming in uh, and really being transparent in the time of prayer. And so what ends up happening is for a lot of people, a lot of believers actually, we avoid prayer, right? We just, we avoid prayer. Um, some of you, when I said at the beginning of this that we're going to break into groups and we're going to pray together, your thought was, I'm going to find out when that is, and I'll step out and go to the bathroom right before then. <laughs> because I'm not doing it, right? And let me say this, if you do it, that's okay. Uh, you know, we, if you got to step out in that, in that time, uh, I'll just point you out and we'll all look at you before you do it. No, I just, we, won't, we, won't do that. We, won't, we won't do that. I promise we won't do this. We won't. No, no, okay, all right. Prayer 
is so, prayer is so vital, prayer is so remarkable. And so what I'd like to do is, is look in Acts chapter 1 uh, in, in what uh, Luke, uh, what God spoke through Luke and says to us about how these first disciples engaged in prayer. And so let me give you again quick context. If you're here this morning, you know that what's happened is Jesus has reminded the disciples what the primary mission is, right? The immediate mission. So Emory hit it right on the head is to make disciples. You're going to be my witnesses in all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth, right? That is going to happen. That's the primary, that's the priority mission, right? Now let me say this. Uh, there's an ultimate, uh, there's an ultimate purpose that every purpose, uh, every person is invited into, and that ultimate purpose is this, is to know God and to love God, right? Because when we when we go to heaven, right, that is what we will be, that is who we will be for the rest of eternity, people who know God and people who love God, right? And the outflow of that is glorifying Him and worshiping Him and all of that. That is the ultimate purpose of every single person. But the immediate priority right now is making disciples, Right? That's, the, that's the immediate priority now. The ultimate purpose is always knowing God and loving God, but the immediate priority right now is sharing the gospel, or is making disciples. And so Jesus reminded them of that, and then he ascends, and then the disciples are waiting for the promise of the Father. And who do we say that the promise of the Father is? The Holy Spirit. And when he comes upon you, you're going to receive power, and you will be my witnesses. And so when, when we pick up here, right, we're looking uh, at verses 12 through 26. And I'm not going to read all of it this morning. Uh, we'll kind of jump around a little bit. But starting with verse 12, it says this. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. And all of these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now, the question that immediately comes to my mind, and, and you can probably answer this very quickly, but I think it's an important question to ask, is why were the disciples waiting and praying? Why were they doing that? If you look back to verse 4, what does Jesus say to them? He says to them this, while staying, we talked about this morning, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait, but to wait for the promise of the Father. This is so important to grasp because this has everything to do with what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, right? When the, after Jesus ascended, their first response was to return to Jerusalem, to go to the upper room, and to wait. Why? Because that's what Jesus told them to do. You, you, have to, you have to understand that that in itself is so central to what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Obedience to Jesus is the central call for every follower of Jesus Christ. Okay? That, and, and actually, that is the call for all believers. Right? It's, to, it's obedience to who God is, to his character, to his will, and to his plan. This is the way we like to talk about it at our church. We, we uh, define this in three words. Hear and obey. That is the essence of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. To hear and obey. And quite frankly, that's the message all throughout Scripture. From Old Testament to Revelation. Think about this. Adam and Eve. Right, they're in the garden. Did they hear God's voice? Yes. Did they obey? No. no. Right? That ended poorly for all of us. Right? That was not good. Um, Noah, did, did Noah hear God's voice? Yes. 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 Did he obey? Yes. yes. And we see how that played out. Abram, did Abram hear God? Yes. yes. And he obeyed, right? And so you keep going through the scriptures, right? You can go through every story, right? Abram, Joseph, King Saul, right? King Saul, did he hear God? Yeah, he did. Did he obey? No. no. <laughs> and that blew up in his face. And that's why King David came in, right? And so, you know, King David heard God's voice, obeyed, 
disobeyed, then obeyed, right? Like, you know, he, he's like the realest guy ever. Um, so you go, you know, all of the prophets, they heard God, they obeyed, right? Jonah heard God, ran, got taken up by a fish, vomited out, great part of the story, right? He's like, okay, okay, I'll listen, right? So uh, all of it, right? Jesus, think about what Jesus says, John chapter 5, he says this, the son does nothing on his own, he only does that which the father tells him to do. John chapter 8, the son says nothing of his own accord, he only says what the father tells him to say. I did not come to glorify me, I came to glorify him. Right? Peter, James, John, all the disciples, Paul, you read throughout all of the scripture, the message is this, hear and obey. And what you get is a description of either the, the, the outcome of what it looks like to obey or the outcome of what it looks like to disobey. That's what Scripture is pointing to. And so you have to understand that these disciples, hearing the words of Jesus and living in obedience to them, right? They didn't run off. They didn't go do what they wanted to do. They didn't do what they thought was a great idea. They said, Jesus told us to stay and to wait. And so that's what we're going to do. And that's what they did. That is so central to what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Because the alternative is this. I will intellectually assent to the fact that there is a God and there was a guy named Jesus who was pretty special. And I'll believe that and still be in charge of my own life. Do you see how those two are at absolute odds and in contrast with one another? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so obedience to Jesus is the central call for, for every disciple, every truly born-again believer is called to obedience to Jesus, which is why I go back to this morning. The mission, the mission of every single believer is to make disciples of Jesus. And so while they're together, you see verse 14 that all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, right? And, and here's, here's what prayer is. Whether you recognize this, maybe you use these words or these verbs or maybe not. But here's what prayer is. Prayer is intentionally relying on God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is intentionally relying on God. And these disciples leaned into that. See, that language that says they were devoting themselves to prayer, right? The literal translation actually could be played out in one of two ways. They persevered. By means of prayer, right? Meaning they were sustained, they, they, they were kept in the faith because they were praying, or they devoted themselves by means of the prayer, right? So it could be two, and I actually think both of those are right. Because <laughs> actually I think you need both of those. So it persevered, they persevered, they stayed true, they obeyed, they walked in alignment with God by means of the prayer, or they devoted themselves Right? They stayed committed by means of the prayer. And so for these early disciples, the way to obedience was through praying together. That's where they dove into. Jesus told us to wait. I kind of really want to go. I want to do something else. I think there's other things we can get into. And yet they said, no, stay. Stay. Let's pray. Let's realign. Let's, let's intentionally uh, rely on God through prayer. And I think what's interesting, it doesn't play itself out in the English very well, in the English translation, but there's actually a definite article in front of the word prayer. So uh, maybe your translation, like mine, in the English Standard Version, says they were devoting themselves to prayer. But the actual literal Greek is this. They were devoting themselves to the prayer, right? Or the prayers, and so, uh, I, I don't know for sure that this is the point that Luke is making, but I, but I think the crossover can happen, that the prayer may have been pointing to Luke chapter 11, verse 1, right? And in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, this is uh, the part where the disciples are following Jesus. They come up to him, and this is what it says. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord Teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. 
And then he goes into what we now know that we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. And he gives us this model for praying. But the disciple, we don't know who it is, but the disciple, right, says to Jesus, teach us to pray. And there's something that screams out in my mind, and it's this. If prayer is something that can be taught, then prayer is something that is learned. Okay? I think many of us hold to an assumption that when you come to faith, you're either downloaded with this ability to pray, right, or you don't, or you don't have it. And, and there are people who can pray, and there are people who can't pray. And if you can't pray, just be quiet in Sunday school class or small group or whatever it is. You squeeze the hand of the person next to you so to let them know you're passing. You know, whatever, whatever the metric is or the, you know, the method that you use. Um, but, you know, if, and we have this idea that I either got it or I don't got it. But when I look at Luke chapter 11, verse 1, it tells me that if prayer can be taught, then that means prayer is something that's actually learned. And you just don't wake up with the ability to do it. Right? So it can be taught. Because the disciples need to be taught. So I want to encourage you with that. You might be here this evening, and you're like, I don't know how to pray well. I get nervous. I, uh, my, my words you know, don't come out right. And, and I don't pray like that guy or, or that woman. And, and she, she prays so clearly and so eloquently. And I can't do that. Right? It's like, that's okay. You don't have to pray like that person. You know actually what Jesus said about prayer in Matthew chapter 5? Don't use a lot of words. Don't ramble on and on and on. Your father knows what you need before you ask for it. That's what he says about prayer. Right? So you can learn, you can grow in praying. Now I want you to notice back in Acts chapter 1, uh, as these disciples are gathering for prayer, not only are they praying and they're waiting, but if you go on a little bit further, and we're going to read this, but um, they have to select, they have to figure out who's going to replace Judas. Right? Because he didn't do so well, if you've heard that story. Um, but they're like, who, who's going to replace Judas? And what do they turn to? Prayer. They turn to prayer, right? This, here's the prayer that uh, Peter prays. And he says this, You, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Right? And so they're praying. They're praying. Again, this is another really important moment to catch. And it's this. Walking with God, right, through faith in Jesus Christ, being a disciple, being a follower of Jesus Christ, walking with God is designed in a way, intentionally, by the way, it's designed in a way in which you will always need God. Let me say that again. Because that's both very, very important and it's very, very threatening. Let me say this again. Walking with God is actually designed in a way that you will always need Him. There is never going to be a time when you don't need God, right? There's, that's never going to happen. Actually, if you're living apart from Him, or if you're living or doing things without God, the Bible actually defines that as sin. To live separate from God, to live apart from His leadership, is called sin in the Scripture, and sin always leads to death, right? Because at its essence, I want to hang with me for just a second, at its essence, sin is self-leadership. Sin is independence from God. That, that's what it is at, at its core. Think about Adam and Eve. God clearly spoke to them. And he said, I, I want you to live this way. And what did they do? I'll do what I'd like to do. You can try to blame it on the serpent, right? But it wasn't, it wasn't you know, the serpent just opened the door, right? Satan just opened up the door. They walked through the intentions that resided within them. God, I'll be in charge. I, I know you have this guideline, and you've taken care of us so well up to this point, but I think I'll take it from here. I'll be in charge. The essence of sin is self-leadership and independence from God. Now, that gets played out in lots of ways, right? Lots of evil ways manifested right through addictions, manifested through lying, through anger, through hurting, through all of that stuff. But that is the core of it. 
Sin says, I'm God. I know there's God, but I'll be God. I'll be in charge. I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, God. You do what you do. Leave me alone. I've got this. That's the essence of sin. Self-leadership, independence from God, is the essence of sin. And you have to. And, and that's the problem that Jesus came and solved. That, that's, that's the whole thing. He came and he dealt with that. Right? And so you've got to understand, this is where it goes back to the idea of obedience, this goes back to the idea of prayer, is intentionally relying on God. You have to submit into your spirit and into your mind that there will never be a time when you don't need God. You will always need Him. We're made that way. We're created to need Him. We're created to rely on Him. Where do you think you even got your breath from? Where did your spirit that resides within you even come from? God gave it to you. We're designed to need him. And prayer is a declaration of your dependence on God. Right? You are declaring to him. You're declaring to yourself. When other people hear or see you praying, you're declaring to others, I depend on God. Could I potentially figure this out on my own? Maybe. But I'm not choosing that lifestyle. I've lived that already. And I know where that's a zero-sum game. And I'm choosing to walk in alignment with God. And depending on Him is central to that. One of the ways that I have found um, to, to help me grow in prayer and to grow in that dependence on God is essentially to use Scripture to pray. Uh, that has radically transformed uh, my time with God and, and how I pray, what I talk with Him about, all of that. Because before then, um, I kind of just, I would catch myself praying for the same things, like all the time. Uh, only, just even the same words, sometimes without even thinking about it. And it was just like, I'd kind of get to the middle of my time of prayer and, and I would get, like, catch myself like, whoa, I, what, I don't even remember where I was at because I was just so caught in this road mode of praying all the time. Uh, but since le really leveraging the scriptures uh, to shape my prayer, um, and I, it's, God has just grown me so immensely with that. And so here's, here's what I've learned to do. And this is not original to me. This is something I've learned from other uh, leaders in history and, and other uh, church leaders too. Um, but it's this. It's to begin with scripture, right? To, to read a passage, to read whatever it is. You know, you can use a, di a, a daily Bible reading plan, whatever you're on. But whatever your passage you're reading for that day, that's where you start with. And you simply ask the question, what is this passage teaching? Right? You ask that question and you answer it from, from the scripture. So you're simply going to begin uh, by reading a verse or reading a passage or a chapter, whatever it is. And you're going to begin with the scripture and just ask, um, what is this teaching? And you're going to try, you're going to learn, you're going to, uh, you're going to discover, you're going to ask, you're going to do all of that stuff. Then from there, you're actually going to use the scriptures to shape your time of praise. You're going to use the scripture to shape your time of confession. You're going to use the scripture to shape your time of asking, uh, in, you know, in your time of prayer. And so you're going to praise God. You're going to praise God using the verse and what you've learned. Right? And so you're going to celebrate his character. You're going to celebrate his power. You're going to stand in awe before him. You're going to bless God with worship during this time. Using what you've learned and what the scriptures say. Then you can move into a time of confession. Again, using what the scriptures teach. Now, I'm going to explain this uh, quickly in just a second and how this plays out in real time. But during this time of confession, this is more than, uh, God, I, I said a bad word here and I, and I kind of misled. I actually just kind of lied to this person. And, um, you know, I got two cheeseburgers in the bag instead of one, so I really should have gone back. You know, it's like more than just going through and listing all the things that you did wrong. What confession really is, is confession is expressing Right? Exposing our innermost desires. Saying, God, this is who I really am. On the outside, I might be able to pull this off, but in my heart of hearts, this is what's true. Confession is comparing yourself to the person of Christ and recognizing how far away you really are from Him. Right? Uh, confession is self-examination and then applying the gospel to that. 
right? You're like exposing, these are all the ways I've hurt you, these are all the ways I've let you down, these are all the ways that I desire these other things that aren't you and aren't in line with your will, and then you're applying the gospel to that, because you're saying, thank you that I don't have to earn my redemption. Thank you that I don't stand condemned for these things I rightly should stand condemned for. Thank you that Jesus Christ has borne all of the weight and all of the wrath and all of the penalty that I deserve for these things just today, just in this last hour, just in this whatever, and Jesus has saved me from all of that. That's confession. That's confession. Recognizing all the ways you fall short and then applying the gospel to that. And then closing in a time of prayer, interceding on behalf of yourself, Interceding on behalf of your family, uh, praying for, for others, right? Asking, seeking, knocking. Now, what's, uh, what's remarkable and what I've found in my life since leveraging the scripture to shape my time of prayer, I am celebrating, I am confessing, and I am praying for things I never even knew you could or should praise God for, confess of, or, or pray for, right? It has so radically revolutionized my time in prayer. It's been remarkable. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to kind of make this real for a moment. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 1, so let's look at verse 14 for just a moment, okay? Uh, can we bring that? Oh, hey, dude, Brennan. You, we are like in sync, dude. I'll tell you, this is awesome. So Acts uh, 1.14 says that all these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Now, if we just look at this verse, and we know that's in the context of something larger, but if you were to kind of maybe summarize this verse into an idea of what this passage is teaching, what, what might this passage be teaching? So this is a moment of risk. You're like, I don't know if I'm going to talk in front of everybody. <laughs> Come together in prayer. Okay, yeah. I, I, I would actually agree with you overwhelmingly. I think this is a clear moment. Uh, it's kind of a practical thing. The disciples are coming together. They're committed to one another. They're committed to prayer. And so I think what I wrote down is actually very similar to what you said here, is it's normal for disciples to pray together, right? And so we're coming together. And so when you think about that, if I was going to use that right now to shape my time in praise, how I might do that is something like this. You know, I might praise God simply for the blessing, the miracle of prayer. God, I praise you that I even get to pray. I praise you that I even get to talk to you. That, that I don't need, uh, outside of Jesus Christ, I don't need another intercessor. Right? I don't need a priest. I don't need a whatever. I can talk directly to you through faith in Jesus Christ. Right? Uh, I, I might spend time actually praising God for the gift of the family of God, right? I praise you that there is a church family who loves me, who knows me, who's available to walk with me, who encourages me, who blesses me. Right? I praise you for that good gift of the family of God you've given to me, right? That God, I praise you for your character of, of, of community, right? That's just built into the Trinity, right? We're not meant to live in isolation, right? So, so that's just, we're, we're at praise, right? We haven't got anywhere else. And you can spend, who knows, how much time just praising God for everything that's in there. Now, when I would go to the confession, I might do this. I might confess to God that God, it seems normal for these disciples to spend time praying together. And if I'm being honest, uh, it is not intentional for me to spend large amounts of time praying with other disciples, you know? I confess I pray alone, but I don't pray that often with other disciples. And this verse seems to point out that actually praying with other disciples is key and really central to walking in fellowship with you and with others. I might confess that I rely on myself too much for the things that I assume I can handle. I got this one, God. You help somebody else right now. Right? That's confessing that. Right? I confess that there are times that I think I don't need. That's me exposing my innermost, right? I'm being transparent before God. And if I'm being honest, there are times in my life where I've got a God. And I don't think I need you. That's, that's, the, that's the, the, the kernel of sin. That's where that begins, right? And so I would ask him to forgive me. 
and I would ask him to change me, and I would praise him that Jesus Christ has covered every single one of those. Right? I don't deserve to be forgiven. And I don't, be, I don't deserve to have a clean slate. I don't deserve to be righteous in his standing. But Jesus has done that on my behalf. Right? That's being real about who you are and then applying the gospel to your life. That's confession. Right? And then in time of prayer, I might spend time praying and asking God to grow me in, in praying with other believers. I might spend time praying for my family that, you know, we would spend additional time intentionally praying together outside of just before meals or before bedtime. Uh, but we would actually just stop in the middle of the day and we would pray together. I might ask God uh, to intercede on the behalf of other people who aren't yet believers. And then I might be able to get time to pray with them, right, and to point them to hope in, in Jesus Christ. Do, is this making sense how you can take Scripture and literally let it shape how you pray, how you praise God, how you confess, and how you pray. Do you begin to see when you think about all, right, there's 66 books in the Bible. And I can't remember off the top of my head how many verses are in the Bible, right? But every one of those exposes the character of God. They expose his desire and his will. Think about that. You know, my, my prayer life has just exploded. Since doing this, like I said, I'm praising, I'm confessing, I'm asking for things. I didn't even realize that I could ask for, but Scripture is guiding my prayer in such remarkable ways. It's like, wow, and I can't wait to dive into prayer, all right? Now, here's what I want to do, all right? This is, this is a little risky, but I think it's worth doing. Uh, you know, you don't have to go far if you got to travel. You just turn around if you're already in a little cluster. But I want you to group up into groups of like maybe four, five, six, whatever's right around. If you do need to move to be a little bit closer to somebody, go ahead and do that. Um, but just kind of, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and do that now. Again, turn around, and I'll kind of give you instructions within all of this as you're doing that. We're actually going to take time, and we're going to engage in this right now. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with a, a verse. We're going to start with the one we kicked off with this morning, which is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And if we're in St. Brandon, that's going to be up there. Right? Oh, that's what I'm talking about. My man. All right. Okay, so Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let's do this. Um, if you, let, let's, uh, let's read this, well, if you, I'll just read it for you because some of you aren't facing the screen. But here's what it says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So real quick, if we were going to put this into kind of a, a you know, what is the scripture teaching here? What would you say that the scripture is teaching here in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? Yes, power to witness. 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 Yes, perfect. Okay, let's, let's synthesize and put that together. That when the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us, we will have power to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Would we agree that that's what this scripture is teaching? Yes. I, I think that's right. I would agree with that as well. So that's the central teaching here, okay? That the Holy Spirit is going to empower us to be witnesses for Jesus in the world. Now, here's what I want you to do. We're going to take a few minutes right now, and I want us to spend time first praising God, using this scripture and what we just talked about. Then we're going to spend some time confessing. And here's what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to guide us through this, okay? And then we're going to spend some time praying and asking. Now, here's what I want you to do. Because some of you guys like are really comfortable praying, and if given the opportunity, uh, you'll take the next 20 minutes <laughs> and lead your entire group. <laughs> and while we're grateful for that, we don't want you to do that tonight. Uh, so we're going to use a little technique we use at Lighthouse called sentence prayers, where we pray one to two sentences max. Okay? And then once you're done, you throw that over to someone else to pray one to two sentences at the most. Okay? Um, so that's what you're doing. You, you get one and, all right? You can't be throwing in 18 hands and run on sentences. It's an apostle Paul prayer, all right? This, this is a sentence prayer. <laughs> oh, so you guys got that one. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, good. So let's do this. Let's bow our heads. Let's co close our eyes. I'm going to open us up in prayer real quick, and then I want you guys to pray as well. And, and pray out loud. I encourage you to do that. Father, we are learning to pray using Scripture right now. So Holy Spirit, guide us in this in real time. 
And so in your groups right now, somebody can start. Again, we'll just kind of bounce around. Spend time praising God. Let the teaching of the scripture shape that, that the Holy Spirit empowers us to be witnesses for Jesus in the world. Let's take a few moments and go around the circle and praise God for that teaching and that truth. Go ahead. and then we're going to switch to confession. seconds and then we're going to switch. Father, I praise you that you give us the gift of yourself and you equip us to share your good news with everyone around. Let's take some time and move to confession. And this is a moment for you to ask the Holy Spirit to, to, to mine your, your thought process, your paradigms, right? Let him uh, confront uh, maybe, uh, you know, uh, half-truths you bought into or even lies uh, and bring truth to that instead. And so confess uh, what you may believe or live in, opposite, in opposition to what the Scripture is teaching. So again, just one to two sentences. This is a time to, to confess to the Lord uh, in regards to the scripture. minutes and then we're going to switch to pray.
20 seconds that sometimes when you ask me to, to talk to someone else, um, I get afraid and, and I believe the lies of Satan over believing the truth of your word. Forgive me for that. We thank you that we don't stand before you in our own merit, but we stand uh, on, on, the, on the person of Jesus Christ. We stand on the record of Jesus Christ and that he has made us righteous by faith. So thank you, Jesus, you who knew no sin, who became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. We're going to close in a time of prayer. And so I pray, you can pray for yourself, you can pray for your family, you can intercede on the behalf of someone else who's not a believer, whatever it is. But again, one to two sentences, using this teaching, uh, pray, uh, right? Ask God. This is a great opportunity to ask, seek, and knock. So let's see, we'll take a few moments and, and pray. Go ahead. seconds and then we're going to wrap up. centric churches and empower them to be uh, people who take the gospel everywhere we go. We know that's what you've gifted us for. We ask these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Hey, I, I don't know how it was in your group, but I can tell you from just listening, it was a beautiful sound <laughs> to hear you praying together. Um, and I would say this, uh, what we talked about tonight, this is not like a silver bullet that solves everything all of the time. It is a way. It is a tool. I think it's a pretty good one, but it's not the only way, right? Uh, you might use like, you know, the, the axe after You might, you know, leverage something else. That's fine. Um, actually, you can leverage any of that. Man, just let Scripture guide what you're praying for. Because this is what I talked about this morning. You're praying the things that God would desire for you to pray about. Right? Does God want people to come to faith in Jesus Christ? You better believe it. <laughs> that's, an, that's a prayer he says yes to. Does God
God wants you to walk in the empowering of the Holy Spirit? Yes, without a doubt. So this is the stuff that we can pray for. Now, we're going to wrap up here in just a second, but I want to remind you this. The ultimate call of every disciple is to know and love God. That's the ultimate call for everybody. And the immediate mission, right, in the here and now, is to make disciples. And so what I want to give you is this quick little tool that you can use to actually engage in gospel or spiritual conversations with people, right? Your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers. I've used this to literally begin conversations with complete strangers, okay? And it's simply this. Offer to pray for somebody. That's it. That's it. Simply offering to pray for somebody. Here's how, if it's somebody I know, right, like uh, I have a neighbor, uh, he lives across the street, and so sometimes I'll say to him, well, the first time I ever said it to him, I said, hey, listen, uh, I'm trying to grow uh, in my relationship with God, and so I want to start praying for people when I talk to them. Uh, Scott, what's a way that I can pray for you? And at first he's like, huh? <laughs> and he thinks for about five seconds, and he's got a prayer request to share with me, right? Um, I was, uh, I'll do it to complete strangers too, like they're out in Kroger, Walmart, or whatever. Um, especially, right, like the checkout people, because they can't go anywhere, right? You, get, you, buy, you, buy, you buy a lot of groceries, you got time, baby, right? So, so I'll, I'll be there and I'll just say, hey, listen, this, this might be a little bit weird. I said, but I'm one of those Christians that actually believe that God answers prayer. Um, is there a way that I can pray for you? And again, there's this initial, oh, um, well, yeah, actually there is. Uh, when Christine and I will go out to eat uh, sometimes, uh, we'll, when our server brings our, our food to us, I'll say, hey, uh, we're Christians and we're going to thank God for this meal. And I'm wondering if there's a way we can pray for you uh, while we bless God, uh, or we thank God for this blessing. Um, I'll never forget, you remember that? We were at the uh, Applebee's or something like that, and the kid, like, he was like, didn't know what to do. And he actually like, put our food down and ran away. <laughs> and, and he came back. And he was like, uh, yeah, I actually have something for you. And, and he tells us about uh, his mother who is going through chemotherapy for cancer. And if we could, So we just held on to him for just a second and took five seconds to pray for him. Uh, he left. He came back. He didn't say anything. He left. He came back and said, that was amazing. And then he left again. And he never brought us drinks. Right? Like, <laughs> 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 But, right, so you, you, you can do this with people you know. You can do this with people you don't know. Uh, I was at the gym uh, on Friday. Uh, I think it's when I called you guys at home. Uh, and there's a new guy that was working there. I've never met him before. And I'm, I'm literally leaving the gym. And I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, pray for that guy. Don't leave until you pray for that guy. And so I'm going, oh, all right, all right. I'll do it. And as soon as I'm getting ready, some, somebody else comes in to like check in and kind of is like, oh, well, God, he's going to be busy. I can't, uh, you know, I, I can't interrupt him. And that guy like leaves immediately. <laughs> and I'm so close to the door, I'm ready to leave, and I just can't shake that God told me to pray for him. And so I stop and I turn around and I go, hey, uh, my name's Fritz. Um, I believe God answers prayers, and I want to know if there's a way I can pray for you. Uh, long story short, um, I find out this guy's name is Clayton. Uh, he's a 32-year veteran on the police force. Uh, who's had some major shifts in his life, and I got to pray with him right there uh, in the gym. And what's really amazing is uh, I'm going to start seeing him four days a week, and I believe God's going to open up a door uh, for something there, right? Uh, I have never had anyone turn me down for prayer of anyone I've ever asked. I've never had anyone turn me down for prayer. And so you can offer to pray for somebody and then pray for them right then and there. I take five seconds and I tell them that. Can I pray for you right now like five seconds? And I keep it to five seconds. And I pray for the very thing they ask me to pray for. And I say amen. And then there's two directions I'll go. If it seems like there's a door that's open, I'll engage in more conversation. Try to find out a little bit more about who they are. I might even get to cross the line where I ask them things like, hey, do you ever think about spiritual things? Or I might even ask the question, do you think that someone could actually personally know God, right? And whether they say yes or no, right, you know, those are open doors. Um, now, if the door doesn't seem like it's open and I can't engage conversation, I just let it go, right? I just let them, hey, man, thanks for giving me an opportunity to pray with you. 
and I scoop, right? Because that's Matthew 13, right? Indiscriminate seed scattering, right? I don't believe that every person I talk to, I'm going to be the one that leads them to faith. I might be scattering seed, I might be watering, I might be whatever it is. I'm just playing the role that the Holy Spirit allows me to play in real time. But it starts, it's just a simple tool that says, how can I pray for you today? And no one's ever turned me down for that. So here's what I encourage you to do. I want you to encourage uh, do this tomorrow. Start tomorrow. Uh, it's what we call pray, go, pray. Okay? And it's simply this. Begin your day with prayer. And, and just, it doesn't have to be super long. Just pray this. God, would you help me to see opportunities where I can engage with people with the gospel or to pray with them? Would you show me open doors to be able to connect with people? Right? Would you give me the boldness to actually engage in conversation with them? Right? That's pray. The next step is go. Right? Go is simply this. Go about your day. Do whatever you do. Go to work. You know, uh, you know, frisbee golf, I don't know what you do. But, you know, whatever you do, just go about your day and do that and look with eyes wide open where God might be at work. And when you see open doors, walk through them quickly. Right? Walk through them quickly. Because they don't stay open real long. I can't tell you the number of times where I've heard God say, do something, and I balked and I stalled, and the moment passed. And I missed it. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about right now. And then, whether you get an opportunity to engage or you don't, End your day with prayer. And thank him for the opportunities, the steps of growth, the seeds that were planted, the way he used you, whatever you need to do. Pray, go, pray. Uh, maybe you would engage in that tomorrow, and you come back tomorrow night. Maybe you'll have a story to share with us. Maybe you'll have a Clayton that you met tomorrow, right? Or maybe you'll corner the girl at the check-in you know, check line because you bought your week's worth of groceries tomorrow and she ain't doing nothing for the next three minutes except scanning your stuff. So, you know, you, you get to pray for her. Listen, God will do impossible things when we pray. He does. It's who he is. It's who he is. In 2007, I received a call from one of my sisters. Um, Dad had an accident and he was in the hospital. Uh, long story short is this. The diagnosis, glioblastoma grade 4. The most aggressive form of brain cancer that you can be diagnosed with. And I was shocked. And I was angry. I, 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 just, I was feeling everything. But I just, I just kept talking to God. I just kept talking to God. I kept confessing. I kept being real about who I was. I kept being real about and honest. I didn't understand what was going on. All of this. My dad had surgery to remove the, term, the tumor. And in the process of doing that, it took away his ability to live on his own. Mm -hmm. And so after a lot of prayer and being reminded in 1 Timothy that believers take care of their families, no matter what, Christine and I went to my dad and we invited him to move in with us and to live with us so that we could care for him since he wasn't able to live on his own anymore. Right? All that baggage, everything that was hanging there from before, we just knew that God wanted us to do this. And so for the next four months, the most challenging four months I have ever lived through in my life. I don't know if you have ever had to carry your dad up the stairs to get him to the shower, because that's how light he is. Right? This guy who used to carry you. Heartbreaking to go through. The other side of that is this. My dad got a front row seat 24-7 to the gospel playing out in Christina and I's lives, right? He, he got to see uh, how we prayed together. He got to see, uh, you know, how, how we confessed, how we, how, when we blew it with one another and we tried to make it right. I had people from our church family would literally come and hang out and play cards with my dad and watch old spaghetti westerns with him. So Christina <laughs> and I could go on a date night, right? And they genuinely loved my dad who they had never met before that night that they came out to hang out with him. But he got to see it all. And on December 14th, 2007, I'll never forget, I heard God say to me, you need to go talk to your dad, not as his son, but as his pastor. And so I went and I talked to him for two hours. We talked about God, and we talked about scripture, and we talked about Jesus and the gospel 
and in all of that, right? I walked in to a room of a man who was waiting to die. And I walked out of that room of a man who had begun living for the very first time. God saved my dad that day on December 14, 2007. Amen. Never, ever forget that day, right? He was different. <laughs> he was just different. We prayed together. We, we, read, we started reading scripture together. He came to church. I'll never forget.